Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to be before you today. And I want to thank the Chancellor and the Provost and the Alumni Association and you, who are my colleagues and my family at the University of Denver for being here today. Let me tell you how I'm going to approach this. I'm going to talk to you as family and not lecture to you. And that we will share in a dialogue, a discourse, a discussion. And I hope that you will as passionately engage me as I hope I come across to you. And I'm going to talk about it on three levels, from a strategic level, an operational level, and a tactical level. You, so you can see the influence that the Department of Defense has had on me. <laughs> it is now ingrained in my vocabulary. And it probably was there all along. And I wasn't willing to go in the military I have, because, you know, if I couldn't go in as an officer, I wasn't going in. So I knew my type A personality. So I wanted to be in charge. And yes, I can salute smartly. And I learned how to salute smartly. And fortunately, my southern upbringing taught me how to say yes, ma'am, and no, sir. <laughs> Although I did rebel at the age of 16 at home and told my mother that I could say yes and no respectfully without saying ma'am or sir. I actually got away with it. So the art of negotiation was in play at that particular point. And I think most certainly being the youngest child also helped a little bit along the way. So let me tell you first about the shoulders uh, that I stand on from this university. Uh, Dr. Karen Feste, who an inspiration and mentor for me. Dr. George Shepard, Dr. Tom Rowe, and Dr. John McCammon, whose shoulders I most certainly continue to stand on today, who helped to refine me, shape me, mold me in terms of my theoretical and analytical capability. I can't say enough for what they have given to me and even in Washington and Ethiopia, I reached back and knew that I could reach back. They were my academic role models, but they were most certainly my family. I was in their homes. I was there with their children. I was there for the weddings and the celebrations and the holidays. And so my extended family was in Denver. And when you are coming from Opelousas, Louisiana, and it's your first time away from home. And it was my second master's degree. I think they tricked me a little bit, because I thought I was coming into this PhD program. And they said, oh, by the way, you have to do another master's. And I had one. But I did negotiate a year of coursework, so I was, I was working on that. But it was my second home. And the family, in terms of the students and the alum who were there for me, and you know, there were many names, and I'll only mention a few, and one of them is in the room, Monyet, who had graduated before I did, but met her in another venue. And she reminded me today that you haven't changed a whole lot, Cindy, <laughs> as only she could do, you know, and Ahmed Samatar, and uh, Trina DeNavo, and these were all my classmates who continue to be my family today and worked with me both in my personal life and my professional life. And you say, what has that got to do with career? It has an awful lot to do with my career and my life. And I know sometimes you'll hear people say, well, how could you do that and have a life? Actually, a student asked that yesterday. Did you have a life? I've gone, of course, I would never say I didn't have a life. I always manage to secure a small portion that allowed me to deal with family and friends and to have a sanity check. Because titles are wonderful, but titles go away. Family should always be there, family and friends. And the university is very much part of my family. So you have to have passion. You have to have a conscious choice and decision about what you want to do, and values, and mission, and service, and cooperation with others. 
and to know from my perspective, you cannot do it alone. I didn't get into those positions by myself, but I had to demonstrate the capability and the capacity to those individuals in order to be allowed to be in those particular venues. So it was a long road to being ambassador. And to be perfectly honest with you, it wasn't on my to-do list. And I did have a list. After I left graduate school, I really thought teaching was the only thing I could do. And teaching is an honorable profession, and I've come back full circle. And I wouldn't be here without the teachers in my life here, the teachers at the University of Louisiana, those teachers in junior high and elementary, Ms. Dayton in fifth grade, who's taught me how to diagram a sentence. Critical when you're trying to write a strategy paper, when that sentence needs to say exactly what that sentence needs to say. So when you see this picture up here in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, in the African Union Forum, there's a long road to get there. And it was a road with many options, choices to make, which road to take, and not without a lot of hard work and not without failure, because I don't see how you succeed without failure. So I don't know if failure is always the right word, and, but one should not be ashamed to say that you have failed. I think the shame comes when you do nothing about it and move on, or to say that doesn't work for me and maybe I need to take the next road. And that failure may open the new door to take you in a direction that is far beyond anything you could have possibly imagined. And so, you know, it's been a good life. It will still be a good life. I feel there are a few more options along the way and a few more challenges. There were personal challenges and sacrifices that had to be made in order to have the path. I chose. And students asked me about that yesterday. They said, well, what did you give up? And I said, what did I give up? I didn't see as giving up. I made a choice to do something else. And I said, you know, there have been great relationships. There have been hundreds of children that I've taught who I see as my babies. And they will be my babies. And that part of my personal life is warm and rich and will continue to be. And that part of my life enriched my professional life and choices. So my personal life allowed me to stay grounded when you're sitting with the title of ambassador. And you have to remember, it's not about Cindy Corville. You're the ambassador of the United States. You represent the country. You don't represent yourself. Your life is no longer your own in that public setting. And everything you do reflects on your country. So how do you get out of bed to go to work when every moment of your life is scrutinized? You remember, most importantly, mission. What is it you must do? What is it you must accomplish? And what can you do? to accomplish that within a critical time frame. You know, speeches are great, but what's the action plan? And I'm an action plan kind of woman. So what are we going to do? How are we going to make it happen? Who do we need to bring in to make it happen? What lines do we need to cross in terms of ideological orientation? And when you're in the government, and if you want to succeed, you better try to be bipartisan in doing it. The benefit of working Africa, historically, has been that it's been a bipartisan issue. So, you know, the playing field was a little bit more even to work those issues. It would have been great if we could have seen that across the board then under the Bush administration, and particularly under the Obama administration, the challenges we face as a nation today on all fronts requires a bipartisan engagement. It doesn't mean you give up your ideological orientation, but for democracy to work, there must be compromise. And I'm talking to an exceptional group in here, and I know you know that. The challenge is how do we make sure that happens? So let me give you a little background story. How did I get there when I said it wasn't on my to-do list? So 
I show you this picture for a couple of reasons. One, to set the stage. It's the Oval Office. And how many of us get a chance or even dream of the possibility of being in the Oval Office? It doesn't, you're in there for the president, you're in there for the office, it doesn't matter the party, you're serving your country. And as a civil servant, I was there in that capacity as a civil servant detailed to the White House. And the National Security Council, as you know, 90% of the people who serve there are civil servants and not political appointees. That 10% who serve in those other key positions are political appointees, and it's structured that way for a particular reason. I forgot to mention one classmate, and how could I? Condoleezza Rice happened to be my classmate and met her here when I was in Denver. And so there are people who open doors and give you an opportunity. And Condi is a tough cookie, so Cindy, I opened the door, and can you hang with the big boys and girls? Well, let's see, OK? So it's up to you to be able to stay in place. What I knew was fundamentally important was developing a policy for Africa. Not since Bush 41, Bush daddy, had we had a written, formalized Africa policy. Jendai Frazier was also part of that team who taught at the Corbell School and was Condi's student. Uh, they affectionately said there was the Denver Mafia inside the White House at this particular time. There was no longer just Harvard and Yale controlling the area. So I'm going like, rightly so, Denver needed to be in the room. And Condi did bring many other Denver folks into the room to give them the opportunity, some young people too, to see what it's like to be in the room. And that is our responsibility when you're in those positions, to bring other people in the room so that they understand how it works. And so from a perspective here and how my analytical foundation served me was what's key for US strategic engagement in Africa. We had historically, let's say starting with the Monroe Doctrine, said nothing to do with the continent. We're in this particular hemisphere. We start with the Carter administration, Carter, Clinton, we begin to build a dynamic engagement with the continent, but primarily through a humanitarian lens during those times. But tough to level, or leverage in this case, engagement when you have competing issues. So when you're in the NSC, you're competing for the president's attention. You are responsible for directing his policy, both in terms of the geographical area and in terms of the functional. And you're saying, oh my god, well the president can't do all of this. So you need a team with experience who defines what the core issues are and what's doable in that time frame. Because you can have the best strategic plan and if you have no money, it doesn't make any difference. So you learn who your friends are <clears throat> in this case. And why do I tell you this? I had a unique experience, not just being here, but before I came to the table. I worked in the intelligence community. I worked in the Department of Defense, which gave me a broad preview of how the system works. And if you're going to get anything done in Washington, you have to know who does what where and how to leverage them into a particular position to work an issue. So it's negotiations all the time. The very structure of our government, the laws, the legislation, dictate that particular type of engagement strategy throughout. It's the beauty of democracy. It's the curse of democracy as we work with it. And a president has four years to accomplish. Career-wise, when I walked in the door from leaving Occidental College and coming into the intelligence world, not an easy transition. Academia was anti-intel. You were a traitor to the cause if you chose to work into the intelligence agency. So when I talked about earlier conscious choice, I made a conscious choice. Now, one side of me said you can infiltrate the organization, guerrilla movement tactics. <laughs> you can go in and before you know it, persuade them in a different direction. <laughs> Ambitious mission, you know. Since my dissertation research was on <laughs> liberation movements in Zimbabwe, 
you know, I had a master plan for how to go in. And it's interesting that, you know, the fact that I didn't get tenure at Occidental College was the best thing that ever happened to me because I wouldn't have been Ambassador Corville. So a different road, a different path, no regrets whatsoever. You, you take that leap of faith, you go with it, and I always believed somebody was going to catch me. You know, no one was going to totally let me hit that ground. I might get close to the ground. I might hover a little bit. You know, but there had to be a patron, and mentor is important, but you need a patron. Because patron will just pull you back up. Patron has the power and the ability <laughs> to affect change. And so being a, an astute student, at least I hope I was, you know, thought I was, um, about hearing about that new incoming class, I'm not so sure I'd have got in. But, you know, <laughs> with those records, but thank you, they let me in, and I proved to them that I was capable. So I got into the intelligence agency. Uh, I actually burnt some bridges with certain parts of academia because it was the political times. And I understood that. I thought I could make a dent in what we do as a country. I thought I could possibly better inform and analyze a region that we weren't paying very much attention to at that particular time. And there was an Army colonel who actually opened the door for me to do that. He had guest lectured at Occidental College, uh, Colonel Dan Hink, who also had a PhD in anthropology. And he guest lectured to my, that was my last year of teaching at Occidental, probably my best year of teaching. I was free, no, no restrictions on what I did. And, and it was liberating. I'm going like, OK, well, what do you do afterwards? But we'll worry about that a little bit later. OK, so Dan Hink said uh, to the students, there are all kinds of career opportunities in government. And, after, and I said, what about me? Network, 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 you know, fundamentally important is what I've told the students at the Corbell School this week. And that man didn't know me, took my resume, walked, you know, flew back into D.C., walked the circuit, and a year and a half later, I was in the Defense Intelligence Agency. Takes a little while to do the background check to get you through, you know. Strangely, though, I, I interviewed in California over the phone. And I have to thank two other people who, and one was a DU alum, Kenneth Harrell, who graduated from the business school. He, his wife and I were friends and met on jury duty. And, you know, first time I ever did jury duty, I was the foreman. Of, how did I get to be the foreman? You know, somehow that, that happened. And she and I hit it off. She worked at the Jet Proportion Laboratory, and I am a sci-fi nut. And she helped build the Hubble. And I was just in total awe of her capabilities in this part. So I was like, OK, can I go into the clean room? And she took me in the clean room where they designed it. Can I have pictures of Mars? Because you know I want to go to Mars. That's the last thing on my agenda, space travel. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do it, but it is on the agenda. And so we became good friends for three or four years. And then I didn't get tenure. And about a few months before I was about to finish up the year, they came in and said, you know, it's better to be unemployed in LA. You know, the weather's great, you know. <laughs> you can get to the beach. They had a nice guest house. They said, the guest house is yours. Pay your telephone bill. And you know, us DU folks got to stick together. So there was someone who caught me one more time. So I didn't hit the ground totally. And it was that opportunity to go forward. So I interviewed sitting on the bed looking at the flat irons next to the pool, you know, and it was like, okay, this is a great way to do an interview. Uh, but I also knew I was going to go into a different political culture, a drastically different political culture. So the need for flexibility, as I've told the students, and the ability to adapt, and you have done this in your careers, I know, multiple times. And you've made these conscious choices to adapt and to contribute. And so from that perspective, the intelligence community became, uh, and especially not just CIA, but I was in DIA. I was in Department of Defense, hierarchy. Remember I told you I, I had this little issue about uh, needing to be in charge, so suddenly you're in a hierarchical structure. 
And I made a decision to go in. I didn't go in at the highest level. They said, can you wait another year? And I said, you know, I've been unemployed a year and a half. I think I probably need a job. So, okay, GS-11, take me, you know. I need to get in and I need to understand. That understanding gave me another level of foundation in which to design policy and strategic, you know, engagement. But it was the analytical skills that I learned here. It was the teaching experience for 10 years where I operationalized that and how you take ideas and communicate to students with. And I'll give you a specific example. Uh, I think they put it in the bio and they put a little probably too much. Um, Charles Taylor, notorious Charles Taylor of Liberia, uh, who had engaged in some pretty horrendous levels of repression of his people, uh, all over the sake of diamonds and power. And we have, who is the current president today, President Sirleaf, who had been imprisoned, tortured, detained by then President Charles Taylor. And we knew in terms of West Africa, uh, Nigeria had played a large role in intervening, had negotiated the removal of Charles Taylor and to get him to peacefully step down and go have a little spot in Nigeria where he could be somewhat comfortable. Uh, sort of the unwritten agreement that heads of states had on the continent. If someone in the region was destabilizing not only their own country, but the whole region, then in particular West Africa, the presidents would get on their plane and fly in and see you and have a conversation about you might need to move on before we help you move on in this particular case. And the Nigerians had put military on the ground in their own peacekeeping mission and had lost lives. But then they leveraged him and said, you know, either in probably polite terms, we take you out or you, you leave. Uh, as only the Nigerians with the gravitas and political as well as military leverage. And sometimes you have to combine these things in order to negotiate. At least from my looking at guerrilla warfare, you needed the two. You need to talk, you need the leverage in terms of threat. You don't always have to actualize. So, okay, Charles Taylor, long story short, is sitting in Nigeria. He does need to be held accountable. In the history of the African continent, no president had ever turned over another head of state or former head of state to face, you know, the courts. The Nigerians, and you know, we've had a good relationship. They're an anchor country on the continent, good, bad, or ugly. Foreign policy, policy is not black and white. It is very gray. And yes, there can be good and evil. It's not that clear. You can call it an axis of evil, but it's never quite that black and white in a given situation. And there has to be compromise. There has to be the greater good. And what are you going to do? And what are you going to give up in order to do the greater good or to save the most lives? The intelligence on this and, and track record on the Nigerians and on the continent is, again, as I said, no one had given up a former head of state. So the likelihood was that they would not do this. So you have tactical intelligence, you have operational intelligence, and then you have strategic intelligence. When you're in this office, it's all about the strategic intelligence. The responsibility of the NSC and the president is the broader picture. The responsibility of the agencies is to operationalize that broader picture within the context of the laws and the restraints and the fiefdoms between agencies, which there are fiefdoms, and there are 16 intelligence agencies, only three of which are responsible for what is called finished intelligence. That is to say that finished product. That's the in State Department, INR, and then DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and then CIA. Those three agencies are the only three who produce. Now today we have the larger umbrella, DNI, which is a little murky. Is it the 17th agency or is it in control? That we have to wait and see a little bit on. So I'll take you back here. I just told you a story. 
the operational tactical intelligence said, never going to give him up, oh, boss and Joe president, it's not going to happen. You know, okay. The strategic intelligence, Jendai Frazier, <laughs> myself, and others looking at the information, analyze the same set of facts, look at different conditions on the ground, and argue there is a window of opportunity. Aha, dangerous. Did I prepare my letter of resignation? Yes. You know, <laughs> if it doesn't work, you're gone. Okay? <laughs> Tag, you're it. And uh, at that time, uh, Andy Card was the chief of staff, and when you'd come into these positions as senior director, professional assistant, he would sit down individually and tell you, now, if you cannot serve the U.S. government, if there's a policy that you cannot adhere to or work to support, or that you, you didn't just support, you had to say why you didn't think something would work, but at the end of the day, you salute smartly, then you need to sign a really great letter of resignation. Because that letter was going to be in the presidential library, and generations after you, your family were going to read that letter. <laughs> it made sense, okay, even if it was a short one. So, and, and look, this is, it's an interesting thing. It's a heady feeling being there, and it's a god-awful scary feeling. Because you're responsible. Someone said the kid from Opelousas, Louisiana, might be able to handle these decisions. So the part of you, the fear that is there, keeps the adrenaline flowing and should hopefully keep you stable. The values are fundamentally important, and you need to know when to walk away. Fundamentally important, at least from a personal standpoint. And so with the thing with Charles Taylor, the NSC and State Department believed that this president would turn over this guy. Well, there were some intervening variables in play. When Abbas and Joe got on the plane to fly across the Atlantic, Charles Taylor had an inkling, or his analysis said, this might be the end. So he got in the vehicle and headed for the border with a truckload of diamonds. He said, I'm out of here. Okay, a calculated decision. A boss and Joe's in the air. I'm not under detention. I can get in my car and I can go anywhere. But a boss and Joe's in the air and gets the message that you uh, snubbed his hospitality, which from an NSC State Department, you opened the window to hand him over. Like, God, divine intervention. Thank you, God. Charles Taylor went out because it was going to be rough to get a boss and Joe to turn this guy over. Window of opportunity. And if you're a Zartman fan in international relations, the right moment was there. So you had to seize the day, carpe diem, come on. So we've got this policy that, you know, one of our strategic goals is to have Charles Taylor delivered to the head. Okay, you can have the goal, but how do you operationalize the goal? We had been working two years to negotiate with the Nigerians, not making as much headway. So the moment is there. And if you don't seize the moment, there might not be another moment that comes around that allows you to facilitate the implementation of your policy in this particular case. So a little insider stuff. What happens? Nigerians are going to hit the ground. The decision was, was looming as to whether you should still have the meeting with President Abbasanjo. And there were members who said, we should not meet with Abbasanjo. He didn't hold up his end of the bargain. He probably let the guy go. The intelligence community said, yeah, he let the guy go. He had no intentions of giving it up. And so you under analyze the individual. You analyze his cabinet and said, this is not going to go well. The Nigerians are going to lose face, especially this president. He's the anchor to the region can't possibly happen. He's not going to allow it. And so Charles Taylor has just put the nail in the coffin from our perspective. Uh, there were some, as they say, bigger people than me who were saying you shouldn't have the meeting. You have to lay out a cohesive argument, two pages to say why this meeting should happen, what are the possible outcomes, what would it take to make that outcome happen the way you think, what would be the intervening variables, and how would you control for them? Two pages to make sure that meeting happens. The analytical skills, your ability to write well, fundamentally important. You don't get to see that insider thing that happens. 
24-7, not a glamorous job. No, there isn't a vehicle in a car. And yes, I'm working seven days a week. And yes, I'm on a government salary. So <laughs> there's, there's not all these other glorious things in play. It's mission that is important, service to country. What happens in that given situation, we laid out a plan, Jendai Frazier and I, and said to Steve Hadley, who was the National Security Advisor, President Bush must meet with President Obasanjo. Why? Because we don't want anybody to snub our president ever in that particular way. It is a head of state he's meeting with. I don't care who the head of state is. If it's a bad five-minute meeting, then it better be a bad five-minute meeting and send them on the way. But no meeting was a major international incident and would undermine our position on the continent when you snub the biggest guy there. And so that was the argumentation. The other argument was that he is going to turn him over because the door has now opened. So there was pushback in the room from more senior people to say, don't let it happen. And I hope it was, one, the quality of the paper written, the effective argument that Jendai and I put forth uh, that said, you need to give it a shot. We have more to lose by not having this meeting than we have by having the meeting. And we laid out the what the way the meeting should occur, or as you said, we cooked the meeting before the meeting happened. So Steve Hadley's counterpart was going to walk in this room, and Steve and General Mohammed are the best of friends. Because what's my responsibility for the National Security Advisor? To make sure Steve and that guy are the best of friends before they get in there. And we said, Mr. Hadley, here's your paper. This is the strategy. Here's your talking points. Kind of put it to the side. We'll go in all in the meeting. There'll be about you know, six of us in the meeting to begin with. And then about a half an hour into the meeting, I'm going to signal you. And we are thrown out of the room because you and your best buddy need to work this out. Because we only have about 10 hours before the meeting is supposed to happen. So in that course, they come in. I nod my head. Mr. Hadley sends us out the room. They stay another half an hour. They negotiate. We call back in. Jendai and I are sent to meet with President Abbas and Joe to say, this is the game plan, sir. We've agreed upon it. The two national security advisors are together on this issue. And, and Abbas and Joe said, OK, it's, it's, it's a plan. 3 o'clock in the morning, Blackberry rings. Guess who's in the clutches of the Nigerian military? Charles Taylor. So the 10 o'clock meeting happens, and the visuals, I, I wish I did have those particular pictures, uh, the Nigerians in flowing robes, you know, along the colonnade, come into the Oval Office. The, our guys in the room with the suits and the red ties are there. <laughs> you got to have the visuals, because, you know, the imagery is good. <laughs> You know, and they come into the room, and there's this hi-fi throughout the room of Nigerians and Americans that Charles Taylor has been brought to justice. And within the next three weeks, Charles Taylor was on a helicopter to Sierra Leone and to be given and on his way to The Hague. But all of that was a two-year process to make one moment happen. And without that one moment with Charles Taylor, it could have been a longer period of time. There are intervening variables that you cannot control. And I'm probably over time, but I just can take two more minutes and, and just add a couple of things. So from my perspective, the experience or how policy is most affected and who shapes policy, the National Security Council, Department of State, Department of Defense, those are your three biggest players. The last one you ever want to play is the Department of Defense in terms of your national security. That should be, from my perspective, your absolute last resort. I can say in terms of Africa policy that we had some major successes along the way. The, we extended the African Growth and Opportunity Act. We created the Millennium Challenge Corporation in which African countries were given full grants for infrastructure development. USAID does not allow us to build bridges, roads, and those kinds of things. So we needed another structure to do that. 
We were also successful with the HIV AIDS program, which saved lives. We worked closely in Darfur. I went to Darfur three times uh, uh, during my tenure. And you cannot control an event. You can help facilitate change. And my personal argument is you cannot make a people want something more than they want it. So if you don't want your freedom and you don't want to be liberated, then for me, it's a colonizing effect to come in. If you're going to own it, if you go into it. But they have to have the political will and the ownership of that. And OK, I, I thought you'd like this one, because I've got the president at attention. And I am in, I am in professorial mode at this point. <laughs> And I'm only allowed to do that because he's allowed me to do that. So I want you to understand that the Africa policy went as far as it did because a president allowed it to go as far as it was. It wasn't the expectation of anyone that Africa would have been on the radar or the focus of this administration. But putting together a strategic plan and a way to implement that plan and how the resources could be utilized to facilitate our engagement in the continent so that it would be a win-win situation, you have to get the attention of the president. And so, as I said, all those regions and functional offices within the NSC are competing. We were competing with Iraq at this time, and we got money and resources. So the ability to effectively put together a plan that you was doable in a certain period of time is fundamentally important for any administration, Republican, Democrat. If you, OMB is your friend, the Office of Management and Budget, you know, when you're in the NSC, the intelligence senior director is critical and most certainly legal. You can't move a piece of paper unless those guys are in play with you, and is it doable, and you're competing with other entities. So, you know, I did have to compete with Elliot Abrams in the Middle East, and I'm going like, what democracy do you have there? Excuse me. We got some democracy over here in Africa. Fragile, but it is, so we can see doable outcomes. So I've been a little bit teasing and a little bit candid, but it required um, a leap of faith based on your capability and capacity and someone willing to believe that the argument you put forth is a viable one. And there are no guarantees in terms of policy. You have to look at the conditions that are present at the moment. You have to look at who the key actors in the particular setting. You have to say, how do we operationalize or leverage these relationships in order to achieve a particular outcome, and it does require compromise in order to do it. So you had to give up something to get something. Did I take some hits in the office, as they say in Washington? Most certainly I did. Did I get my hands slapped? Most certainly I did. Uh, but I believed in the policy positions that we put forth, and there was one last situation where there was an issue of a particular meeting that was to happen with the president, and I did not support the meeting, and State Department supported the meeting. And I wrote the fem first memo saying why I believe this is a meeting that the Secretary of State or anybody else should have, but not the President of the United States for these reasons. Uh, memo got sent back. I said, okay, let's push the envelope. I wrote a second memo, and I reconstructed it, same outcome, the president should not meet with this particular individual. The press will be bad. I don't see what we get out of it. We'll compromise the individual for coming in. Um, I got another no. I'm going like, OK, you really do probably need the letter of resignation, because I'm going for a third time. Uh, not advisable, but I, you know, it was my values at that point, and, I did, and that I didn't believe this was in the best interest of the country, and most certainly not to expose the president to this particular individual. And I got a nice note back: there are bigger people than you who want this to happen. So stand down. So I stood down. 
and I wrote the talking points and I prepared the meeting for the president and um, I'll say I got the interpreter because the person wasn't fluent in, in English. The meeting was hell. We were told by the other group he didn't need an interpreter. He needed an interpreter. Because uh, I'm the note taker in the room. There's no recordings of the meetings except for handwritten notes. And the president w looked at me kind of like that. And uh, I said, uh, I, put, I, I was very Department of Defense. I put my head down. You know, head down, nothing coming. Just let it go over your head. I go like, okay, head down. And squint up, you know. <laughs> Because what I wanted to do, I said, I told you, but I couldn't do that in the Oval Office. And so decorum must take place. And so I tease a little bit, but it really was a bad meeting. And it wasn't the best use of the president's time. And the president did, after the meeting, question the meeting. 